The titles are doozy. It's very long, but what we're going to be uh, talking about essentially is scaling. And there's some lag. But basically, there's two kinds of scaling. Vertical scaling, which is when you have a huge uh, machine. And horizontal scaling, when you spread the load between multiple machines. So yeah, scaling. So basically, I mean, I can wing it without the slides um, by the time they come by. So in this talk, well, goals, great. Um, I want to contextualize um, you know, vertical and horizontal scaling. I want to show you a cool new idea I have for a sharding scheme, which has atomic cross-shard transactions. And we're going to explain exactly what that means. And, but more importantly, what I want to do is demonstrate some research process. So like, hey, can we do this? There's a problem. There's a solution. Maybe it's at the end and we need to go in our direction. So can I illustrate the process? And generally, what I want is to foster interest in this kind of research. And I want, I want people to collaborate with and, and to work uh, with me and, and with us at Optimism on this stuff, because this is the kind of stuff we care about. This is not something that's really on the roadmap. It's a complete side quest. And so, like I said, this is a nerd snipe. Like, this is supposed to be brain candy, super interesting stuff. But if you want to work on it, you should talk to me. So, like I said, vertical scaling, big machines, horizontal scaling, many machines spread the load. And in terms of Ethereum, vertical scaling has been done by rollups, right? Rollup enable vertical scaling because if you're a validator, you can validate the rollup by validating the Ethereum main chain. There's only one extra assumption, is that there is one honest L2 validators that can also uh, supply data for the rollup. But the question is, OK, we can scale vertically, and we can probably scale Ethereum 10 times maybe 100 times if we start pushing some buttons, like scale database and things like that. What if we need extra scalability? Um, and, and there's multiple reasons we might want that. So one is that, sure, we could like require a data center for L2 sequencers. But we want to have a healthy um, validator network. And not everybody can get a data center, not, ev not even every company or every DAO. So we might want to spread the load so that you can validate a subset, really, of the chain. Our uh, thing is that we might want many different rollups. This might be rollups with different security assumptions and different parameters, like different fee, different uh, pay tokens in a different uh, pay fees in a different token, increase the throughput, change the validity rules, maybe use a different VM, all that stuff uh, you might want to do. But you might still want to have multiple rollups talking to one another. OK, so there's two main approaches to horizontal scalability. One is parallelization. And in that approach, you're going to have a big blockchain, lots of state, and you're going to spread the load between machines. Two options to do that. Optimistic, you just try to do things in parallel, and you hope they don't touch the same state. If they do, you just throw away one of them, and you start again. If you do this, the pitfall is that you can't increase the throughput, because um, basically, you can't charge more for uh, transactions are not parallelizable. That's because you don't have a, a clear criteria of what is parallelizable and what is not. Our option is to use a well, strict access list. Uh, some fancy people call this uh, UTXO, but I think strict access list is clearer. And so basically, that's shipping every transaction with a list of either all the contract that it touches, so you can have a lock on the contract, or all the storage slots that it touches, so you can lock these uh, specific storage slots. Uh, the parallelization approach Still assume that you have one entity that validates everything. Just now it's spreading things like across cores and across machines. So it's still a high cost on validators. If you want to reduce the, the load on validators, you may want to do sharding. And then validators can validate a single shard. So a shard is basically a, a small sub-blockchain. The annoying thing with that is that apps now need to think about um, on which shard they want to deploy, which might not be great. But the great thing is that we can do heterogeneous rollups. So like I said, you can customize rollups to have different VMs, different fee models, and things like that. And they can all talk to each other. Uh, the problem with sharding is that if there is no way for shards to talk to one another in a way that is effective, this is a bad solution. So I'll explain what you know, an effective way means. But as you guessed it from the title, this is about atomic composability. 
So this is an example I would use for a cross-shard uh, transaction. It's a transaction that swaps Bitcoin for Ether on shard A, then bridges the Ether to a shard B, and on shard B will buy an NFT for Ether. So this is specified in a single transaction that you send either to a system or to shard A, depending on, on your architecture. So one very desirable property is atomicity. If any part of, of this reverts, everything reverts, and in this case in particular, if you can't buy your NFT for either, then you also don't want to swap your Bitcoin for either. Sometimes you can achieve this via application level atomicity. Um, but in this case, it doesn't work because, sure, if you, you, know, if you can't buy your NFT for either, you could swap back your either for Bitcoin, but now you've paid two swap fees and you've been exposed to Bitcoin either volatility. Uh, but there are sometimes cases where you can revert the action on chart A. And if you can do that, then you can do... Oh, uh, okay. I was standing in the wrong area. So, um, yeah, so in some cases you can do application level atomicity if you can roll back the thing on chart A. Um, so what do we have today? Today we don't have atomic composability, but between pretty much any pair of chains you can do um, eventual delivery of messages. Okay, so Im imagine you have a chain A and a chain B. You can use systems like um, layer zero, uh, I think wormhole does this, nomad, to exchange messages between chains. And what you, you have is that the guarantee that if you do the action on chain A, eventually you'll do the action on chain B. The action on chain B can fail, and there's nothing you can do about reversing the action on chain A. That's what we have today. Uh, that's implemented ideally with light lands and ZK proofs, but maybe also a good old uh, multi-sig uh, that happens. So getting to the fractal part of the talk, we can do a little bit better with rollups, and especially with ZK rollups, we can at least ensure a bound on this, right? This was eventual delivery could mean, if I go back to the previous slide, could mean many blocks. Uh, ooh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. You could back, go back like many blocks in the future, go you know, forward many blocks. What you could do is say, well, we're going to do this on the next block. Okay? One scheme to do this uses ZK rollups. And so basically, you have this architecture where uh, you have a, a parent rollup here, ZK rollup one. It has child rollups, you can roll up uh, 11 and 12. And basically, it's a fractal structure because the roll up one rolls up to the layer one, but the layer 11 and 12, they roll up to the, uh, to the roll up one. And if you assume that there is a ZK proof posted every single block, then now what you can do is do um, instant delivery transaction between, uh, say, this one, 11 and one. So for instance, you could sw do your swap here and then buy your NFT here. It's still not atomic, because you can't revert, but now at least you know it's going to be done like in the next block or one block apart. So that's good, but that's still not what we want. So what about uh, cross shard atomicity? So I'm going to propose a solution for this. Um, and we're going to assume that we are slicing our system into one blockchain block, which is going to com uh, com comprise one block for every shard. So every shard advances at the same rate. And we want to have some form of atomic cross-shard transactions. To enable this, shards need to be able to send messages to other shards. So let's just take the most naive possible idea, which is eager inter-shard blocking. So you just process all your transaction. At some point, you hit onto a transaction that wants to send a message to another shard. You just literally call that shard, you wait for the answer, and then you continue. So this is less crazy than it sounds, and it's somewhat equivalent to what strict access lists do. Because at the, in the worst case, you have the same throughput as a synchronous blockchain, in theory, but you can charge fees because you know exactly which transactions are crossing the shards. Uh, the great thing is you don't need to specify the access list. But the really, really bad thing in practice, not in theory, is that you're assuming that all these shards are being validated by different uh, entities, and so the latency to, for one shard to talk to one another is really high, and so in reality this is not feasible because the latency will just kill any throughput that you might have. Let's try to instead reduce the number of exchanges between shards. Right? Let's try to bound this very tightly. And so the idea would be to divide the, the block time into multiple slots. In the first slot, every shard executes uh, its own transactions and also collects messages to send to other shards. In the second slot, uh, all the shards exchange the messages, 
and then they run the messages that they receive. Optionally, you can keep this going, so you can have many, many slots. You could say, well, messages can send other messages, et cetera, et cetera. I think in practice, you don't really need this. You can have a lot of expressivity with just like one hop, just one shard talking to, one, uh, to another shard. So this is still uh, bounded message delivery, though. You can't revert. Uh, you can't revert part A if part B fails, and that's because other uh, transactions rely on the result of the A part. OK, so this is very unclear. So there's a graphic here. So say I'm chain A, I'm doing my local transactions. I'm doing the A part of a cross shard transaction. And let's say that's, you know, that's a swap. So both of these will be swapping, and then on B, they will be buying an NFT. So this transaction here, the A part, depends on the A part of the first one, because the first one swapped, uh, say, Bitcoin for either, so it moved the price. So this one will use the price from, from that was moved here. So there is a dependency link. And because of this dependency link, you can just revert, uh, you can just revert this transaction if this one fails, because this one uses the result. So this is the problem that we're dealing with. And the general property is that atomicity requires synchronicity, basically. Um, local transactions can still be processed separately, but we would like all the cross-chain transactions to be executed as though it was a single person executing them. Right? Um, so we have a problem, which is we don't want chart to talk to each other too much. The solution to that is to create a special shard, and I'm going to call it the atomic shard, that will execute all the cross-shard transactions. And we have a second problem, is that uh, to execute all the cross-shard transactions, you need the state from all the shards, right? And this, is, this removes one of the big points of sharding, which is that you can separate the, the, the state between all the shards. So uh, the solution to that is to make the execution in the atomic shard stateless. Uh, and that means you will supply all the state that's being accessed by the, the transactions uh, for the atomic shard. So uh, this sounds too good. So where's the poop? The poop is that uh, you need to simulate transactions on, on each shard individually. So in general, in EVM, given that you're not sure the state, it's impossible to collect all the storage slots accessed by a transaction. You can approximate, and the easiest way to approximate is just to run a transaction against the current state and just assume that the transaction before it will not revert. So, you know, here it's easy. You just run the state uh, of the first transaction against the, the state after all the local transactions. For this one, you just assume this, will, this one will revert and execute and simulate. But maybe it will revert, so maybe uh, your simulation will be incorrect. Another thing you can do is anything. So you just um, tell the shard, well, um, this transaction is going to touch this slot, or you can give him some logic to find all the slots that are being touched. Uh, and there's many ways to do this that can be explored. It could just be some EVM code that just touches the slots. It could be some kind of in-protocol information, or even out-of-protocol information that is not being validated, but that's being sent to the, to the sequencers. Um, so I want to make things a little bit more clear. So here's a, a cross-shard transaction, very abstract. It computes things be on some state, and this state might change, right? We're not exactly sure what it is. Then it's going to send a message to shard B, and this message is going to depend on the result of the computation. Uh, that message will have a result. We're going to compute something based on that result, and we're also going to send the result to shard C and then do some more computation. So this shows you like sort of the dependency we have, right? We can depend on the result from one shard. We can send to a shard things that have been computed. And so this will be important to understand later. So to rephrase what I'm proposing before we dig deeper into the problems, like I've showed you only a small part of the poop, a lot more poop coming up. Um, but the scheme is this. Phase one, uh, the shard execute the local transaction, and they simulate the cross-shard transaction. When they do this, they will collect all the cross-shard messages and all the access storage slots. In phase two, we do the exchange, and the shards simulate the messages, and similarly, they collect all the storage slots. In phase three, all this, oh, sorry. In phase three, all this stuff that we collected here and there, we ship it to the atomic shard, and this will uh, atomically execute everything. And normally, it should have um, all the state it needs, and if it does, then it will just uh, basically fail to execute transactions. So. The big problem with this scheme is that the simulation restricts the expressivity. Right? So we can only safely express 
a transaction where the simulation will be deterministic in some ways. Because otherwise, you, you, you know, the state might change and you might not be able to execute things. So you might sometimes take the risk um, that a transaction won't work. Say, well, I'm going to try. If the state doesn't change, it's going to succeed. But if the state changes, it's not going to succeed. Uh, we'll see that sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, by the way, this is exactly the same problem as uh, building strict access list or UTXO for slots. Same thing, you need to collect all the, the storage slots that have been accessed. So this problem is, uh, is pretty similar. So the, the problem, you know, when it gets worse, is that cross shard messages may depend on uncertain state. And we need to derive all the messages during simulation. And that's why we want to be deterministic. Um, we can also want an answer from a shard, and so we absolutely need to have a hint for the answer. So let me illustrate, because this is very abstract. So what I was saying was that this parameter here, x, depends on the result of computation, so this, we need this to be always the same. Otherwise, we're just asking the b shard to compute something that might not be what we want. So we absolutely need x to be, uh, to be known. And you know that the message sends an answer, and we're going to send this answer actually directly to C, so we absolutely need to know the answer already also. Um, I've actually illustrated these constraints. So here we need the computation to be deterministic in the storage class that it accesses. Here we actually need the computation to be deterministic, so to always return the same result. Here, uh, if we use Y just in a computation, we need to hint the result uh, approximately, just to get the correct result. But if we send it to another shard, then uh, we need to know exactly what Y is, like no, no guessing. Otherwise, we're just asking C to do some bullshit, and we don't want that. Um, so open questions. Is this reasonable? Is this a good idea? Uh, are these restrictions um, feasible? Do they give us a, a powerful model that is useful in practice? Another question is, can we statically guard against some, uh, some, some cases of the non-deterministic execution that we want to avoid? Or do we just say, well, it's a user responsibility, and maybe some people will build some tools to detect some of these cases? Uh, this is for sure a foot gun, right? Like, if you're going to make a, um, a cross-shard transaction, and you don't expect it, you expect it to be deterministic, but isn't, there's, there's definitely there are a lot of possibility to make bugs. But is it worth the cost? Our question is, what is the correct Abstraction level for all of this, if we don't enshrine uh, static checks, we can simply add like a cross short call opcode to the EVM. And then just on the back end, it will do what I explained. But from the point of view of the EVM, there's just a new opcode. Uh, this has been my presentation. We have five minutes for questions. I'm sure some of you have burning questions. You should have a lot of questions because this is very questionable. Um, yeah, do you think sharding is maybe just fundamentally kind of impossible and like kind of like when you're trying to do all this like you have all these different systems it's almost like they shouldn't be able to interact in this way it's a really dumb question but um i mean in a certain way you're right like we're the, the whole idea is like you can parallelize what you can but then sometimes you don't want to parallelize and you're just trying to build this hybrid like asynchronous synchronous system uh so yes and no <laughs> Someone else, someone else will come to come to some wacky idea. There's another dumb, dumb question. Yeah. In your model, the, um, regarding the new opcode mm -hmm. that is aware of sending message cross sharding, does that mean like smart contracts need to be aware of calling another smart contract that is in another shard? Yes. How do we envision those things? And also in sharding, without the new opcode, are smart contracts being aware of calling? something that is in another shard, because that brings uh, friction to smart contract developers. So uh, yeah, the model I've, I've been assuming is the model of sharding as like small sub-blockchains. Um, there are some proposals of sharding that I would classify under parallelization. So you just pretend you have a big blockchain, and then on the back end, you just put things in shard and you move things around. But for the user, they don't see that. Here, the model is explicitly you have multiple uh, sub-blockchains and they talk to each other. Um, this, I think, simplifies the implementation a lot. Uh, but not everybody agrees. Uh, actually, my good colleague, Carr, does not entirely agree with that. Um, but that's at least my point of view. And there are other advantages, which is that you can have multiple roll-ups that do things slightly differently, as I mentioned. Um, so that's an advantage. 
Does it okay? So regarding the the sharding in itself, is it possible, for instance, to imagine a system where the accounts would dynamically move across the shards to try to reduce as much as can be the inter-shard exchanges, and so to simplify the whole process, or is it like completely delirious? It is possible. I know there's research on this. I don't really know anything about it. But yeah, I, th I think this was more related indeed to the models where you would just like rebalance the shard and like you would you would necessarily be aware of the shards. Um, yeah, it it exists. It's definitely feasible. It wasn't really thought through here in this simple model. Um, yeah, I think this sort of needs some like like a balance chain where you have all your coins that will probably uh, or at least have your balances be accessible by every shard. That would probably simplify design a lot. And in practice, when we see things like Avalanche, they have like a special like chain for like payments because it's so special and so important. Um, so that might be one part of the answer. Hey, um, my other question was: um, Could we use things such as like AI or sort of predictive behavior in combination with this to sort of like just automatically optimize? Or is somebody working on on stuff like that to to sort of predict the interactions between the smart contracts and how to kind of optimize across shards? Uh, I'm sure some people are working on it. I know, I know there's a bunch of research with that, even on payment chains, so things like Bitcoin and stuff. I don't know why it was very hot academic. Like academics are like lagging behind uh, the stuff we do a lot. And they've been like very, like I've been to a, a workshop this year and they were very interested in exactly this problem. And I'm like, does this change the smart contract? And they were like, no, I'm like, What's even the point? Like, just put it on a big server and be done with it. Um, but yeah, you could do it. I sort of didn't assume that model here, but it's doable. Okay. Thank you very much.